Hey, good morning, everyone. We are live today on the Fireside Chat, and we have a very special guest today, John Bruce. Yay! All right. And um, I'm really excited today to talk to John about his experiences with recordings and um, also just recordings. So John is going to join us here, and we'll just get to hear some of his favorite stories about making recordings. And um, hey, John, how are you doing? Hey, Dave. Great to see you today. It's awesome to be here. So hey, great. Man. Hey, so we got to say hi to some friends here. Hi, everybody. We've got uh, first Ignacio Del Rey, uh, who's uh, at um, Roosevelt. He's a trombone friend of mine. Damn and on. let's see, who else do we have? He he doesn't go to Roosevelt. Excuse me. He's in the administration at Roosevelt. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, let's see, we've got Mark Rauk, we have Juan June, Hi. Bob's Wansko, we have Frank Demler from uh, Berlin, awesome. we have Kayla Torres from uh, LA. Oh, there's uh, Roger Casa, is that Roger Casa? Who else do we have? Roger Casa. Oh my gosh, Roger Casa's watching? I saw somebody named Casa, I bet that's Roger, right? Uh, may, I, maybe. So, and then we also have, uh, who else? Who else is watching? Diego uh, from um, Mexico City. Diego, hey. Tom, my friend, um, teaches down in Mexico City. Bach and baseball. I love that handle. We've got Four Foods, One Eye. We've yeah. got Diego Acaja Clarinetista. Hello, dear John. Hey. Esteban. Esteban joined. Oh, man. I wish we could talk to Esteban about his favorite recordings because he's got like 350 recordings. I know. Well, look at all the ones I have. Oh, man. Recordings and look who's guarding him. Hey, can I finish the rest of my quarantine in your basement, please? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be able to, um, to do a lot. I mean, you know, I've been finally getting a chance to listen to some of these recordings that I've just been looking at for the last few decades, you know. Oh, man. Finally, I can't I, believe you've got them all on vinyl too. Vinyl and and CD. You know, I got I got <sighs> CDs. I got stacks of vinyl all the way from floor to ceiling. My you know, dog. I'm just I'm just so jealous, man. I'm just like I'm a huge fan of like good quality recordings, and I'm a huge fan of like vinyl. I have I have lots of vinyl, and, and it's like to to Teresa's dismay because you know it takes up a lot of real estate here, and she. How can you have all those records? You can always get those online now. And I said, well, some of you, you can't. Some of them you can't, but... Uh, but John, ho hold the fight, man. Hold, the, hold, be strong, okay? Because look, seriously, that's like, vinyl is like better quality sound. And I feel like uh, when you put on a record, number one, you really appreciate it. Cause you're like, this is like something special. This is like a event. Yes. It's an event. It's like... Yeah up and being special i've been looking forward to this morning for a, a long time and Thank I'm, you. I'm really pumped for this discussion and i'm just it's like a treasure trove it's like you and have created this opportunity to open up this treasure trove oh man where do we start i i you know i i think i can only start with when i joined the cso because when we, um, when I joined the CSO in Ju July of 1977, the CSO was doing a lot of recordings at that time. It wow, was a big part of our um, activities, and you know, much more so than than it has been in, in the recent decade or two. Yes. And it was like we didn't used to play as many concerts uh, back then huh. as we do, you know, in the 2000s. But we did a lot more recording in those days. It was like we'd do recording sessions maybe every month or every six weeks. Wow. It would be all organized with um, the schedule of the conductors, you know. So Schulte was the music director. And he, that our part of our schedule would also always be to record some of the repertoire that we were performing at the time. And, and then, of course, um, our summer music director was uh, James Levine. And any time, you know, he was in town, which was for, you know, at that time it was eight weeks in the summer, we would have almost like a recording session every week or every other week. Wow. Wow. 
it was it made for a very um strenuous schedule but it, it was amazing it made for some amazing opportunities and you know i always view uh, a recording as sort of a snapshot of the mm. of what we were doing at that particular time wow so it's like i i anybody that knows me really well knows that I take so many photos and much to my family's dismay, you know, God, why do you keep taking so many photos, you know? And it's because I like to look at them and re kind of relive the memories. And Teresa says, all right, just li live in the moment. Okay, that's great. We can do that. But it's like all these memories bring back a colorful um, sort of uh, just atmosphere sort of um, inspires our current moment in a yes, way. Yes, yes. The CSO recording uh, that was made, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. And then you go and play the same piece on stage. You kind of have that in your mind, obviously. You know, all of us that yes. are, um, the Chicago Symphony, I mean, Esteban totally can relate to this. It's like, you know, he got to know the orchestra through the recordings. And these yeah. are all snapshots over the years and the months and the decades of what the orchestra was doing at that particular moment. I mean, what I'm really grateful for as a brass player is just that these snapshots were created because the playing at that time, I mean, in the orchestra, I mean, was some of the best brass playing ever. Ever. I mean, and it's, and it's just like for us to go back and have an archive of that it's like, oh, we can learn so much just by listening to the phrasing, by the, um, the tone quality, like the direction, okay. you know, just articulations, all these different like things that like now I use as like a um, kind of a benchmark, like a teacher it is. For, for brass playing. And it was so great. By the way, thank you for <laughs> everything that you've been doing these months because, you know, to listen to you play for Dale Clevenger the other day was just an amazing, very, very special event. And you know, um, to hear him play um, back to you on some of the repertoire that we played over and over and recorded just brought floods of memories back to me. Like, you know, it, he played that Schubert nine and I said, Julini, you know, yes. It's just, yes. Because Julini was the one that um, encouraged him to play it at that Andante tempo in two. And wow. it, you know, it brings, brings me back to my, Okay, I've got, I pulled out, you know, a, a little bit of a stack of- All right, we gotta see these, we gotta see these. And I'm gonna get a quick sip of coffee here a Saturday, Saturday morning. Of LPs, and then a, a little bit of uh, several stacks of, of CDs. And I noticed that, um, thank you very much for, for putting down your favorite recordings because- Oh yeah. Me thinking and said, oh yeah, you know, well, one of them that's, I think, should be on everybody's list yeah is i mean and it's definitely on yours and it's definitely on mine um is this aha yes the bernstein recording of uh shostakovich seven it's the it's the only time we ever recorded with leonard bernstein is it the only time you performed with him as well yes it is the only time we ever performed with wow him. Yeah. And um, in modern days, I think he came and guest conducted the orchestra in the 1940s, like in okay. 1948, he might have guest conducted once. Wow. But in 19, this was 1988, we yeah. had the good fortune of Leonard Bernstein in Chicago for a week. Wow. Uh, he did this and we went on tour. We went to New York with him and we did the, uh, the Leningrad, the Seventh Symphony. And I can tell you some stories about this, but I think all the stars were in alignment in in that time because you know Bernstein was already a legendary figure. He was amazing teacher, yeah. he was an amazing musician, and just to work with him it was like you know. And he was a great colleague. I mean, he was the the, the camaraderie with with Bernstein was just like you know he'd come over and hug you and you know slap you on the face. It, it was just like. Amazing, amazing to to be in the presence of this legend that was just one of the boys basically bob wansko uh, says two weeks with bernstein two weeks with bernstein you're right because we did a, a a program of uh of um strauss with him too where he coached three young american uh, conductors 
And uh, one did Death and Transfiguration, one did Don Juan, and one did Till Onspiegel. And I it just like the memories are seared into my brain. And then we went on tour to New York and we took the Shostakovich to Lincoln Center, which was one of the very few times we ever played at Lincoln Center because we usually play at Carnegie Hall. Yes. Wow. That's unbelievable. Do you remember I, who the conductors were? Yeah. Well, I mean, the only two times that we ever played in Lincoln Center were Bernstein and Barenboim. That was the time. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the young conductors who uh, oh, were. Oh, sure. The young conductors were uh, Kate Tamarkin. Okay. She's, um, uh, she did Don Juan, and she was from Wisconsin. And so it was like, it, it was uh, my friend, um, recently retired violist from our orchestra, Bob Swan, and I were just talking the other day. So Bob's on. Hi, Bob. Um, he uh, was bringing back certain memories about various different recordings and one of them was Bernstein he said you know Bernstein and so I think it's on everybody's list the, yes. The, the, yes and he was saying oh yeah I remember when he worked with those um those three uh young American doctors I said yeah you know um Kate Tamarkin was one of them and the other one was uh he did Till Onspiegel it was Leif Bialand. He was okay. So no one, no one that we would know that had like a famous big career. Did you work with Bernstein at all at um, Tanglewood? I was. My, that was my first experience with Bernstein. Was the year before I joined the CSO. I was at Tanglewood in 1976, and that was one of the great moments of my career. You know, I was just 18, and you know, at, at that time, he we did um, uh, a West Side Story with him. West Side Story, Finding Dances. And he coached all the young conductors. And I, I remember, you know, he, um, he, he would coach all the, uh, the fellowship conductors. And um, it, he did uh, Tchaikovsky four, and, and it was just so natural. It was like breathing with him. And he says, and, oh, hi, hi. Well, she's got to come on every chat. I'm sorry. Well, maybe she'd like to say hi to she just she saw she knew the dog was in the room she ran away yeah yeah ziggy he's um he'd love to play with her oh my i'm sure he would <laughs> so and then the other the third conductor that we worked with in my opinion showed incredible um depth and talent and he did the hardest piece which was death and transfiguration oh yeah and his name was John Fiore. He, at the time, he was a, an assistant conductor at the Chicago Lyric Opera. And his, his, um, his dad knew Bernstein. I think Bernstein had worked with his dad as, in some sort of musical capacity. So um, these three young conductors, Bernstein came up and, and sort of like in a very sort of kind way, but also in a sort of like a, you know, he was a master teacher. Um, yes. you know, would work with these conductors and, and get them to do these three Strauss tone poems. And then we'd go on tour. Yeah, Gabby says Ziggy. <laughs> <laughs> My dog Ziggy. So uh, Bernstein was a force of nature. I, probably the number one American musician of all time. I mean, you know, he's the uh, incredible universal musician. Yes. Pianist, composer, conductor, you know. Uh, Communicator, uh, teacher. Huge teacher, communicator, the yeah. you know, lectures, you know, all that stuff. You go back over and over and listen to the young people's concerts. You listen to the Harvard Norton lectures. You, you, you get to, this is a continuing education for every human being. Wow. And th these are mostly available on YouTube, right? The, the, young, the Harvard lectures are as well? Totally are. The Norton lectures from Harvard. And, that, and you know, he'd have the Boston Symphony come in and play. And so that, this is one of the great um, resources for me because my mentor was in the Boston Symphony at the time, Harold Wright. And yes. you, know, you hear him playing all the great, you know, Beethoven sixth and, you know, Tchaikovsky's fifth and Oedipus Rex, all those, you know, all those things that are, that are um, uh, sort of like, you know, immortalized in these, in these performances. So in, in those days, in the 1970s and 80s, our orchestra used to do quite a bit of TV also. I mean, no kidding. Yeah, so uh, my very first recording, I was thinking, was, what was my first recording with Schulte? And actually, my very first recording with Schulte was a video. It was the, the Strauss tone poems um, on a video. And you can get those. I mean, there we did uh, Till Eilenspiegel. We did uh, the four last songs. So I was 
bass clarinet. I was the bass clarinetist in the orchestra when I joined. Oh, so, man. No, uh, it was so cool to play um, uh, Till Eunspiegel and um, Death and Transfiguration, wow. all pieces with Schulte, and to have them videotaped. If you go and look at some of them, it's so funny because I look, uh, believe it or not, I look a lot different <laughs> than I had <laughs> big hair and my face was different. It was just, it was, it's funny to see me in those days. Oh and my gosh, just as a kid, right? Oh my gosh, you know, it was like, I, I, I just, you know, I, I go back and I laugh out loud. <laughs> and then, you know, probably Dale had that big mustache and the, you know, the, the goatee and everyone had big hair. It was, it was great. And it's so wonderful because I, I'm looking through some of these um, CSO recordings and there are, photographs inside the liners you know the the, the beauty of some of these big um big yes here's another one of your wait there it is oh I, I, man you have it on vinyl Mahler 7 with Schulte you know I remember listening to this in a van in Aspen in 1973 somebody gave me a ride you know I was at the Aspen festival in the summer of 1973 and I'm listening to this and I said, God, what is that? It was the, um, you know, the horn, da, 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 yum, ba, da, you know, the, yeah. was the, and I was just like, wow, this is amazing. And they said, oh yeah, that's, that's the new Schulte Mahler 7. This was, this came out, you know, 1971. And so the, it was pre pretty new in the summer of 1973. And then um, it was done, this was one of the, few recordings that was were done in the Cranert Center yes. in, um, in Urbana, Illinois. And you can sort of see the... Yes, yes, you can. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And, you know, the Cranert Center, in my opinion, yeah. is one of the great halls of the world. I, I agree. Absolutely. He said this, of course, too. Yeah, that's what yeah. Esteban says. And yeah. Jen Gunn is, of course, watching. Hey, Jen. Yeah, this of course too. It, it, it's just like, um, and one of the things about recordings in the orchestra is that, you know, you can get a picture of the orchestra, but if the lens is a little bit dusty or if it's a, a little bit out of focus or if it's at the wrong, you, you don't get a really good picture of the orchestra. Wow. In those days we recorded in three uh, regular, two regular locations. One of them was, when I came into the orchestra, was Medina Temple. Yes. And Medina Temple is uh, a, you know, legendary recording location. And that's where I made my very first recording with the CSO, which was this. A Petrushka. Petrushka, 1947, with Levine. Oh my gosh. And, and it, it was done in, um, in Medina Temple in July, on July 11th, of 1977. This this was my second week in the Chicago State Orchestra. And I was playing a bass clarinet. Well, this, in the 1947 version, there are only three clarinet parts. So I was playing third and bass. And that's a big bass clarinet part. Yeah. And I, it was like, I was like in hog heaven. And, and this was this was the only recording that I made with um, Clark Brody uh, playing principal clarinet and me playing bass clarinet. Clark. Oh, wow was the principal clarinetist um, of the CSO when I joined. And um, he retired the, in my second year in 1978. So actually, you know, maybe less than a year after I joined, a Clark retired. And then came um, three person section for like four years or so. So we were shorthanded for four years and I had to fill in and play E flat. I, I was doing some um, first principal clarinet playing I was doing some second clarinet I'd rotate so this was an amazing opportunity for me because I got to record a lot of great things on different instruments in different parts oh wow throughout my um tenure in the orchestra so this is my 43rd year I'm finishing my third year in the Chicago Symphony this this month and it's it's um you know at that time when I joined it just happened to be you know Clark retired so I was able to play all the big bass. I mean, the, the first recording I ever made with um, Abado was. Oh, man. I, I have to know, what was it like to work with Abado? I mean, because I just, his, his, his hands, his expression, the sound he got out of the orchestra. Yeah. 
Abado was one of the greats. And we, he was our uh, principal guest conductor for several years in the 1980s. So, but the, even before he became principal guest, we used to make recordings with him. And um, this was the first one I ever made. And I, and I just remember having such a, you know, Mahler 6, wow. which must have played, you know, last month, is such a, a, a huge um, bass clarinet, you know, um, feature. And I was so, you know, like uh, pumped and excited to play this. And then, you know, I, was, I remember going into the, and this was one of the first recordings that we made in orchestra hall. So uh, Four Flutes, One Eye is asking, what are you holding up? It's uh, This is oh. the Mahler number six recording with uh, Abado and the CSO. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just so you know, these are, they're backwards for oh. us when we see them. So, yeah, just, oh, yeah. yeah. We, we see the cover art and we see like, okay, this is a great one, but. I'll, and, I'll, I'll let you know what it is. Mahler six was uh, my first um, recording with Abado. And now I listen to it and I'm thinking, you know, they weren't able to capture the real um, essence and the detail of the Chicago Symphony because they were still fiddling around in orchestra hall. Most of our really good, rec good sounding recordings at the time were made in Medina Temple wow. and the, in the Cranert Center. I mean, this smaller yeah. seven in the Cranert Center is, I, I took it out this morning and listened to it again and I could not take it off. I was just like, Oh my God, you know, this is like th not only a great orchestra, but every little detail and every little nuance and every little distance and every um, little texture and every little um, density is captured on this recording. And unfortunately, you know, a couple of years later when we recorded, we recorded Mahler 7 two more times. I recorded Mahler 7 twice with the orchestra. I wasn't on the Schulte, but um, in my uh, in 1980, we recorded Mahler 7 with Levine, and no we kidding. Did, we did that in a Medina Temple, and here here it is now. Um, that I I I have a I have great memories of of Mahler 7 Levine, and this was done during you know a very hot summer at Ravinia. We'd go into Medina Temple, where it would smell like elephant dung because <laughs> the most. The, the, what they did with Medina Temple in those days are they um, they used to have uh, circuses there. No, they, no kidding, really? They had circuses. I know. Was, how did it get the name Te Medina Temple? Was it actually a temple? Like a, like a, um, so it, the, the building was owned by the Shriners. It was an organization, ah. it was an organization of, of um, you know, uh, they, they would wear these... Um, the, the hats and they have those parades the little cars right the li yeah i mean they would it, it would be like a public service organization and they would own this incredible piece of real estate which is um a historical monument now and wow. so um they would rent the place out to circuses and high school graduations and the occasional performance and they would rent it to the chicago symphony to make uh, recordings in. And so I have photos of the inside of Medina Temple because no kidding. The temple was such a, um, uh, you know, legendary recording location because the sound that they were able to get in there really did represent the Chicago Symphony at a very high level, just like in Cranert Center. Yes. Um, the Hall at that time, for some reason, did not. And they did, they went through all sorts of contortions to to make orchestra hall, I'll get I'll get to that in a moment. But but here is a picture of so um, my chamber music group, Chicago Pro Musica. Oh wow! Made recordings in Medina Temple. Oh man! 1983. So this was this was one of the sessions of um, of our recording of I think it was the. Um, is that Jay playing trombone? Yes, it is. It's no kidding. Jay Friedman. Oh wow! Uh, it's. Um, George Vosberg on um, what on trumpet. We recorded the uh, Soldier's Tale, uh, and then later on we recorded a couple of. This might have been the um, unbelievable man. Thank you for sharing that. I don't think I don't think we'd ever get to see this. This no. is stuff that, like, honestly, if if you weren't sharing these stories and you weren't sharing like these pictures with us, we'd never see them. 
Well, okay, here's a, here's a picture of the Cranert Center. Yes. In 86, when my chamber group, Chicago Pro Musica, recorded uh. on the stage of the Cranert Center. We recorded some modern chamber music. And it was, um, you know, uh, uh, an ideal recording venue. So wow. even when you're, when you're all set up and, and sounding wow. good, you want the microphones and you want the, um, mm. uh, okay. the engineer to be able to capture everything really, really well. So, so we, were, we were happy to be able to record in uh, Cranert, but the orchestra made several recordings in Cranert. And they all sound amazing. They're, the one that I like to listen to a lot is the Beethoven 9 with Schultz. Okay. No and this was done back in the, um, the early 1970s. And of course, um, you know, the, the uh, whole piano concerto of Beethoven series was done there with uh, Ashkenazi. And two of the Beethoven symphonies, the sixth and the seventh, were, were recorded in Craner. And I think that's it. It's Mahler 7, Beethoven 9, um, Beethoven six, Beethoven seven, and the five piano concertos of Beethoven. And um, that, uh, you know, done in this amazing acoustic of the Cranert Center in Urbana, Illinois. And then the orchestra found that it got expensive because we had to go down there. The orchestra, they had to bring everybody down there, put us up in hotels, stay there for several days, rent the hall, set everything up. It got to be huge, hugely expensive. So then they figured, well, you know, we don't have to pay for hotels if we can record in a location that's almost as good. And so that was why we recorded in Medina Temple, because it, oh. it was home, you know, it was it we just Yeah, to, exactly. They don't have to put people in hotels. They don't have to ship all the recording gear down. I mean, yeah. that makes sense. But I have to say, as a listener and as a Chicago Symphony fan, like those recordings that were recorded in Cranert are absolutely the, the top of the top for me. They are because of... Yeah way that the everything was able to be captured and there's something about acoustics that you know helps the sound yeah or or doesn't and yeah. there, and that location really really helps develop the sound and the way they were able to position microphones and it, it, it really helped to be able to show the chicago symphony in, in its I have, to, I have to back up really quick and just say like um you've played in all the concert halls in the world like like all the great concert halls, like you've played in the proms, you've played in uh, the Philharmonia, you've played in the Music for Ryan, you've played in um, Santori Hall, and you say that Cranert Center measures up in Little Old Urbana, Illinois, measures up with all the top halls in the world. Easily. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like blows some of, some of them out of the water. Yeah, you know, honestly, like, so, I didn't know why we were touring down to Urbana. You know, I, I was, you know, it's, it wasn't, I didn't know the Cranert Center and it's about three hours out of the way. And, you know, I'm new in the orchestra and, and I was just like, man, we're doing a run out concert to Urbana. And everyone's like, oh no. Yeah. Like, and I was like, why is no one like, not like grumbling about this. And then I get there and we played in the acoustics and the sound that we were able to get, I was just like, I think this is the best concert hall. I mean, it's one of the, the better concert halls I've ever played in. I, I like it. Personally, you know, just for me, I like it better than the um, Philharmonie because in Berlin, because for the horn, there's uh, nothing behind the horn, right? So when you play for a horn player, part of our sound is bounced off that back wall and then it's projected. So we, we don't have a directional instrument like a trombone or, or a trumpet, but whatever's behind us creates and the distance from us from that wall, what material it is um, creates the sound that you hear in the mix in the room. And so uh, Cranert has these beautiful, like solid wood panels. Beautiful wood in Cranert. And I remember they closed Cranert for a year back in, you know, the early 2000s for a whole year to renovate it. And they stained or they, they re-oiled every inch of the wood. <laughs> hold, hold on a second. I'm sorry, we, we lost you, John. You, you stained the stain. <laughs> My mom's all right. You can, call, you can call me back later. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So the, the Cranert, um, Esteban says, was it designed by the same architect as the Berliner Philharmonic? I don't think so. I, I do not think that the. Um, I, I had heard that, but I actually, I think it's um, perhaps the same architect that uh, I Googled that, and I believe it's the same architect that designed Avery Fisher Hall in New York. Well, he got he got Cranert right. Yes, he sure did. Yeah. 
it, it's always a treat to play in that um, great hall. It's called the Foinger Great Hall, and it is a great hall. And I think, you know, um, it, if you ever get a chance to play chamber music there, that is really nice. We did, we did a program there once. Dan will remember this. We did the Schubert Octet there, and it, it was just like heaven. You know, it was like, oh, wow, you can just kind of float on this acoustic, and it helps you. And you're encouraged there to play very, very delicately and very, very lightly because every little detail will be transmitted to the listener, just as it is in the Mahler 7 of, of Schulte. And, and that piece, you know, is so colorful because it has so many, you know, percussion effects and so many, um, like, shimmering string effects and so many powerful different coloristic in the, in the brass that it's all captured on, on that recording. And, and I have to say that in, um, in, in the uh, Medina Temple, they did that too in, in several recordings. Um, so my first recording was Petruska. It, it was in, in Medina Temple. And then Mahler, Mahler 7 was done several years later in Medina. And then I remember recording with Schulte in Medina Temple, um, the, the Mahler, Mahler 2nd. No kidding. Okay. Yeah. So, so that was one of the few of the sort of the later recordings that Schulte did in, in Medina. And then he also did Bruckner 5. Bruckner 5 with Schulte in Medina Temple. And these recordings, um, especially the Bruckner, stand out to me as really capturing the energy of the Chicago Symphony, yes. both, both very, very close and very, very far because the acoustics of, of the Medina Temple were able to take that, you know? And so my friends, um, I sort of like, I'm gonna go on a tangent here, but uh, in the early 1980s, I, I had the good fortune of meeting the folks from San Francisco that have a company called Reference Recordings. Huh. They made the best uh, audiophile recordings ever made. And so they, we used to have this thing called the Chicago um, Consumer Electronics Show every year in Chicago. And uh, I just kind of like went over to their booth and I said, hey, you know, would you be interested in recording some um, chamber music from uh, uh, Chicago uh, Pro Musica? And he said, uh, wow, you know, we haven't really done much on location recording outside of California, but... Uh, isn't Medina Temple in Chicago? And I said, yeah. He said, if we can record in Medina Temple, we've got a deal for you. And so in 19, the summer of 1983, Reference Recording brought all their stuff from um, California and we recorded a couple of albums, including The, the Soldier's Tale wow. by Stravinsky. And which, is the, which is the picture that we saw earlier. Right, and then, um, and Dan Gingrich will remember this too. We did Till Eulenspiegel Ein Mal Anders, you know, for five, five players, Till Eulenspiegel, all that done in the legendary and storied acoustics of Medina Temple. Wow. And we won the, we won the Grammy Award in 1985 for Best New Classical Artist. And I really mm -hmm. have to, to think that, you know, reference recordings with their expert engineer and their expert, you know, ability to pick out a recording venue and capture all the details of it, were really as responsible for that as the players. Yes, you know, it, it really makes a difference, you know, because, um, yeah. So, the Deutsche well, John, I, I let me go back real quick. So, um, some speaking of audiophile recording, some of the ones that um, are absolutely legendary of the Chicago Symphony are the Fritz Reiner recordings. Yep, and they're recorded in Symphony Center, then Orchestra Hall. And um, what was legendary about it is, well, number one, the acoustic hadn't been changed yet. Uh, there was a, a change with a Symphony Center that I understand took place in sixty six seven, sixty six, sixty six. They added uh, um, maybe air conditioning. Air conditioning. And they, I think they took out some of the plaster, um, or they removed some of the plaster in the ceiling. So there was no longer this reflective surface for the sound. But pre-66, um, these recordings were made and there was, I guess, one mic in the hall. Is that, is that correct? Is that, you know, like say like the Heldenleben and, uh, you know, the Reiner. 
So the or original recordings made in the uh, orchestra hall that were high fidelity were done in the 1950s. This was before uh, Reiner. This yes. was uh, Kubelik. So yes. Kubelik made a series of recordings. And uh, the most legendary probably of those is Pictures and Exhibition. Yes. So the first of six times that Bud played that opening was for one microphone hanging out in the middle of the hall done on Mercury Classics, who at that time was located in Chicago, it was a Chicago recording company, Mercury Classics, and they had one microphone. Then in the 1960s, or in the late 50s, when RCA came in and started recording the orchestra with Reiner, they, they started using multi-microphones and, and stereo. So the one microphone was mono, you know, in, in the early re recordings, it was just one microphone, one point, and it wasn't even stereo. They didn't have stereo in those days. It was just like one. And then when you had stereo, it was like, oh, wow. You know, it's like you can, you can get better feel for the sound stage, you know, yes. where, where each um, musician is seated. And, and, and you know, e even in the mono recording, you can, you can hear because of the distance from the microphone where the, where the um, musicians are seated. But stereo brought, you know, a new... Um, dimension to recordings. And when RCA came in and recorded the CSO with Reiner, they did it uh, obviously on analog tape. And so these analog tapes have been preserved over the years and, and uh, engineers have come in and like cleaned them up and made sure some of the scratches and things like that were taken out and remastered them. So there's a mastering process where they play the tape and then it gets cut into the grooves um, so that they can stamp the vinyl wow. and stuff. There's there's always opportunity to lose information at any one of those steps. So um, one of them is just the transfer between tape and the um, the stamper. The stamper is like metal that then they use to stamp the vinyl. The vinyl. And so uh, there's always the opportunity to get um, to lose information there. Which brings me to another, I mean, 1983 was a great year for, um, for me because I got to make uh, several recordings um, with my chamber groups, Chicago Pro Musica and the Chicago Symphony Winds. We, we went on, um, th this was a wind octet made of um, members of the CSO that was formed by um, Ray Still, our principal oboist. And so Dan Gingrich and I are the only two remaining members um, that are still in the CSO uh, in the Chicago Symphony Winds. And most of them are all died by now, you know, both, yeah. us, both horn, you know, the, the other, both bassoonists, the other horn player, it's only me, Larry, Larry Combs and Dan are still around. But, but we uh, used to go on like runouts on Sundays and Mondays on tour. We used to take our wind octet and go play, play concerts um, because <laughs> do music that was specifically for that ensemble or did you have any transcriptions made? We had a transcription and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm, I'm going to um, see all this information is flooding back to me, but we went to uh, Los Angeles, California and played a concert there. And on, a, on the next day we went and made a recording on the MGM sound studios for the, a company called Sheffield lab. And Sheffield Lab in those days was making direct to disc recordings. Wow. So they would cut right into the disc and be played. And then you, obviously there's no chance for editing. You just, it's like one performance and it's, it's right on the disc and then that's it. So, so we recorded the Mozart E flat serenade for um, wind octet. And then we recorded a transcription by our bassoon player, the principal bassoon um, player at the time, Willard Elliott had made a wonderful transcription of uh, four of the Grieg lyric pieces. So um, uh, originally for piano and he made a transcription for wind octet. And I remember I had to play really, really high part on the E flat clarinet. And so it was like, okay, how do we figure this out? Because we can't stop and stop the tape because there's no tape. We, we had to like switch the pieces um, and then- Oh, switch the order so you could- Order in order. 
So we record these four lyric pieces first. And the last one had E flat clarinet. And so I had them have my read ready and then put it down. And then like literally like five seconds later, start on a different clarinet, the, the Mozart serenade. And then we recorded the first movement of the Mozart serenade on that same side with the Grieg pieces. And then we were able to take a break and I was like, oh, you know. Oh my gosh. Turn over the, um, the lathe. All these things were installed permanently at the MGM sound studio. And where it, it, that again is a legendary recording location because you know, they made um, Singing in the Rain there. We, we got to see the, the floor where um, Fred Astaire would, would do his tap dancing. Oh, and you know, it was just like all these good vibes were in this room. And we were making a recording direct to disc, which means you eliminate the one step of going to, you know. Tape to, yeah, conversion. Bring it. But that, that's audio file recording there. And nowadays, you know, um, I remember when we used to record uh, in, in, in Medina or in Orchestra Hall, these recording companies like London Decca and RCA and Deutsche Grammophon would come in with truckloads of equipment. They, you know, they, they have a, a tape recorder that was, you know, as, as tall as I am and as, you know, wide, I couldn't put my hand around it. And they, they'd have this tape that was like four inches thick and wow. they put this tape and they record multi-track. It was like, they'd have like 32 different tracks on this one huge piece of tape. Oh and for when they, we, we'd have to wait for them to change the tape to put a new reel on. Nowadays, you can have all that um, equipment on something that's like the size of a, a bread box or the size of an iPad, you know? Yeah. All that stuff is so electronically done. And you know, that it, 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 it Things have been have changed so much since the early days, but um, back to acoustics. When when uh, we'd make recordings in Medina Temple, it was great. They had it all figured out. The acoustics helped helped it out. Then uh, London Decca, or actually Deutsche Grammophon first had the Deutsche Grammophon was with Levine, correct? Uh, well, first Levine was with RCA. Okay, and so he uh, so. This is an excellent point because in those days, um, conductors had conductors had their own uh, contracts with recording companies. Uh -huh. It wasn't the orchestra; it was the conductor. So, if we were lucky enough to get a conductor that had a recording contract, we'd get um, recording, you know, work. And so, we, we were lucky to have Levine with RCA at first, and then during the um, time when he was in uh, Ravinia he um, started up with uh, Deutsche Grammophon. But the other two uh, conductors that we work with regularly were um, Claudio Bado. He was, he was with Deutsche Grammophon for the longest time. And um, the very young uh, upstart guest conductor. Let's see if I can find. Can I take a guess? Can we take a guess? Can we, all right, everyone write in your guesses if you can on who this um, possible conductor could be a young upstart conductor in the early eighties. I I have my guesses. Oh, oh my gosh, Barenboim. Barenboim in Medina Temple. No, kid, look how young he is. Look at those sideburns. Yeah, this this is this is a legendary recording. What is it? What is this recording? Is this, this Bruckner Four? Oh, four flutes, one eye says Baron Boy. And yep. then uh, Dowen Guard says Danny. Yep. And look, okay, take a look at this. This is um this is a picture of the orchestra recording in Medina Temple. Oh wow. Wow. Okay, where are the horns at? I mean are the horns cut off the picture? See here. Okay. You know, Dale was talking about having something behind the horn section when they recorded. Like right. he said, you know, I want something uh, like a, a wooden baffle behind, about six feet behind the horn's bell. And he's like, and then I want mics in front of the horns. And that was really interesting for me. Uh, really quick, we need to say hi to Emma Gerstein. Emma's watching. I loved your chat yesterday. That was, that was awesome. It was so great to, to hear about you know what you did in New Zealand and in, in New World and in Indiana and in Manhattan, it I mean, she's had quite a career. It's really it's awesome to hear. I mean, 
They you, have, have two, you have two, man. I mean, look at all those. Hey, how are you, Teresa? Great to see you. Hey, I, my name. <laughs> I I am not opposed to these records. I love them. You know, I as a recording engineer. Yeah. But I'm mad what? at him if he ever listens to them. No, so I have my time now. It's like, why are, why do we have all these? So thank you for the opportunity. I'm so happy that they're being used and to hear <laughs> the house and you know. <laughs> it's, it's hey, Teresa. You know, if you if you ever want them to be used, you know, just invite a few of us over, you know, like we can have some snacks some coffee and, you know, maybe put a record on. This could be like, you know, record time with John. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that would it. be awesome. We would love that. Yeah. Great to see you. Yep. Great. How, are the, how are the etudes coming, by the way? Huh? How are the etudes coming? The etudes, yep, yep. I've got etudes coming along here and there, but, but I've taken a couple of weeks off because I'm listening to all these CSO recordings. That's awesome, man. It's unbelievable. I mean, you know, just to, um, just to, it brings back so many memories. Like Medina Temple, I have to say, um, is now a, a furniture store. They, they, um, the Shriners sold Medina Temple. And uh, since it is a historical monument building, they could not do anything with the outside of it. But Bloomingdale's bought it and gutted the inside so that that was a very sad moment for oh. every fan of of recordings so uh, what what about what about what year was that within the um uh, that was like in 2000 like uh, just around 2000 that okay. Medina Temple was was sold and um it's like the end of an era almost because in 1997 orchestra hall was renovated for the third time so um, in like you said, 1966, it it had a huge renovation, and then in 1997 um, is when they built um, Symphony Center. Okay, but in in the meantime, it was like in 1986 or something. They had another renovation of the orchestra hall, but it was they installed a new organ, and it wasn't as um, disruptive as the 1966 renovation or the 1997 renovation. But for that, for that season, 97, 98, um, we performed uh, concerts in Medina Temple. Wow. And people, you know, could come in and smell elephant dung and hear the Chicago <laughs> Symphony. But I remember going, going into the control room at, um, at, during breaks of these recordings with Schulte, with Levine, and you know, just just uh, seeing all these pictures of these Shriners wearing their fezes, and and you know, it's just, it it was really an image in many different uh, ways that you you um, remember all your life. Okay, so Baron Boy, he recorded uh, many legendary recordings. The, I think the first one was the Sanson Organ Symphony, and then the second one was this um, Bruckner Four mm -hmm. in Dine Temple. My first year in the orchestra, Deutsche Grammophon decided they'll, they would like to come back to Orchestra Hall and start recording in Orchestra Hall. So um, we did this recording with Barenboim. It's the Moldau, uh -huh. it, it's the um, Hungarian dances, it's Le Prelude, it's uh, Slavonic dances. Okay. And these were done in Orchestra Hall in my first year in the orchestra. So it was 1970. Eight, uh, it was early in 1978. Wow. And I remember uh, I was playing second clarinet. Larry was um, already principal clarinet. And uh, we would have music set on the stage that we hadn't performed yet. It was like, you know, we, we'd practice, you know, at home, we'd, we'd practice the Moldau and Le Prelude. And um, they, they also had the list uh, Raps, Hungarian Rhapsody number no. two. So we're recording all these pieces. We record them twice, put them in the can. And Baron Boim was so clear in those days. There was absolutely no, um, you know, uh, uh, question about where he wanted things. Um, and so we could record things with him without having performed them. It, it was it was interesting. We'd that was going to be my next question is how did you prepare for the recording session? Most of it, you just did you have like a rehearsal and then you're like, all right, there it is. Let's record yeah. it. That's it, on the same day. <laughs> okay, let's record, and that's it. And then, you know, a few corrections, and that's it. In the middle of the list, uh, Hungarian Rhapsody, Baron Boim suddenly stops, and, and it's going, let's take a 20-minute break. 
I said, okay. So we're all going downstairs. We're, um, and nobody's listening to any takes at that time. So we go and, you know, have our sandwich or our coffee. And then um, we come back on stage. And on the stage, on the stands, are Brahms Hungarian dances. Wow. We hadn't performed them. They hadn't been announced. They, it was just like, let's just record these um, and see how they go. Oh, man. <laughs> And we, we never got through the list Hungar uh, Hungarian Rhapsody number two, but the uh, Brahms Hungarian dances are on this recording. And we literally sight read them. Hey, I mean, that's being a professional. I mean, that's like what you have to be ready for anything. You have to say, all right, like I know these and I'm confident in my sight reading skills. That's why you practice sight reading. Like, you know, for when that happens, like you're like, you show up and you're like, this wasn't in the thing, but okay. Like, you know, it could be for an encore. It could be a change of program, a change of conductor. You know, it could be at a recording session. They want to hear, you know, another piece that you hadn't practiced. That's right. So, that's that, a real, real life story, kids, on how sight reading has paid it, off. Incredible. And so um, it, it was sort of hit or miss in terms of acoustics. This one happened to have pretty good acoustics, but unfortunately, um, uh, Abado didn't have a very good, I don't know why, but it was the same company and sometimes the same engineer would come in with Abado as with even Bernstein. And um, they, they just would have different ears on that day or something. So we recorded, uh, so I've made uh, in my time three different recordings of Symphony Fantastique of Berlioz with the CSO. And, and um, the first one I made was with Abado oh. and it was this. And it was like, um, I was so excited because, you know, I was newly on E flat clarinet and I was playing second clarinet um, until the last movement where I switched to E flat. And I, I was so excited that this was being recorded by Abado, who was, you know, amazing. Then when the recording came out, I was listening to him and then I'm thinking, oh gosh, you know, this doesn't sound the way I felt when we were playing it. It sounds like it's underwater. No kidding. Like, Oh, gosh. Um, what did the recording engineers do? In those days, they used to go through all sorts of contortions to make Orchestra Hall sound like the, um, you know, music for rhyme, you know, or to, to make them make it sound like the Cranard Center. Yeah. They would like put plastic and, and um, plywood sheets all over the seats in the gallery and the first balcony of Orchestra Hall. They, they just cover these seats with material which they thought would create more resonance wow like so when there was a recording session you could not have a concert because there was all that stuff in the hall except for our stage crew was so expert that, that it took them maybe two hours to take the stuff down we would have a recording session until maybe four o'clock in the afternoon and then come back for an eight o'clock concert no way and there was all that stuff covering the whole like yeah, all the seats take all it down, and then they put it back up for the next morning unbelievable it, our, our, we have an amazing stage yes we do yeah i i mean chris is like you know unbelievable These yeah, are, all those guys they just take such good care of us and they're so, so much fun too right they like you know so much fun but then to move all the equipment to cranard or to move all the equipment to Vienna or St. Petersburg. We recorded, we made a recording in St. Petersburg. We did Bruckner 8 in the Great Philharmonic Hall in St. Petersburg on our first Russian tour in 1990. What? To tell you, I, if, if Dale is listening, he will not forget this because we're all, we're all like jet lagged and we're all um, dragged ourselves out of bed and we're ready to record Bruckner 8 with um, Schulte. And everybody's going, where's Dale? And it's like, oh gosh, where's Dale? Dale had overslept and missed the beginning of the recording session. So they had to get him out of, of the hotel and drag him down to the recording venue, which wasn't close to the recording session. Oh my gosh, no I, kidding. Wow. Yeah, but, I mean, that, that happens, right? You know, and so what, what did they do when they were waiting for Dale? Did someone else play? Yeah, you know, other people. We we did other spots from the from the piece. They they did tests because they we'd never they never recorded the Chicago Symphony in in St. Petersburg's um, uh, Philharmonic Hall. Okay, and that was you know one of one of our on location recordings, 
And another one was in um, in Cologne. We've made several recordings in the Philharmonie in Cologne, which That's has a really nice hall. Pretty good acoustics yeah. and, and several recordings with Boulez. One of one of my favorite recordings. Um, John, let me ask a question real quick. Is that Bruckner Eight? Is that the one that's available in the Schulte box set? Yes. Okay, the Schulte Bruckner box set. I mean, I have that up on my shelf. Check it out. It's behind me. But yep. we recorded two complete cycles of Bruckner. Yes. One with Schulte and one with oh, Barrymore. Yeah. And it, I mean, do you prefer one particular version of like Bruckner Four over the other? Do you prefer one particular version of Bruckner Eight over the other? Or is it, are they both great for different reasons? I'll tell you, I'll tell you the answer to that. And I, I have to be honest, I, um, I haven't yet had time to re-listen to both of those cycles. Okay. I remember being involved in specific pieces from those um, cycles of Bruckner. Um, uh, the one that, that really pops out to me is Bruckner 5 with Schulte, yes. because that was one of the, um, the final ones that were done in Medina Temple. Oh. And, they, and that was with London Decca and they, boy, they got the sound just right on that one. So I pulled that one out just now and listened to Bruckner Five. And, and I just, I remember when it first came out, wow. uh, I thought, gosh, you know, this is, is right up there with one of the best sounding recordings that I've had. And the orchestra, you know, in its full glory, you know. Um, and then we made a, we made a video with, of Bruckner Five with, the oldest conductor that ever conducted the Chicago Symphony, Takashi Asahina. And that was in 19, uh, I see, 95, I think. And um, they, th this whole video crew from Japan came in to Orchestra Hall and we recorded a Bruckner Five. And that for me is a great um, opportunity because at that time, um, uh, um, Baron Boyman had just was just music director and he had encouraged some of us to to play german clarinets so i don't know i mean you might um, relate to this because when you went to germany you had to play german horns yes and so baron Bern, was very keen on um the the german you know style of of woodwind playing i mean it's a different sound i mean it's a very different sound it's, it's a totally different animal yeah. it's like it's like playing a zebra instead of a, a horse you know because <laughs> it's like there's there are different reeds, different mouthpieces, different design, different fingerings. So we were um, encouraged by Baron Boehm, You guys got to learn German clarinet. You got to learn German clarinet. Um, and so three of us uh, sort of embraced that. And did um, you try? Did you try? I not only tried it. I I bought. It, I got a set um, and learned it. And on that Bruckner five, you'll hear me playing principal clarinet on the German uh, style clarinets. And I think that's, um, that's the Asahina video. And you can get that on YouTube. Why? And you're playing principal? Yeah. Oh, bye, Jen. Bye, Jen. Yeah, as Jen's watching. Jen just said she had to leave, but. I loved your, um, your uh, chat the other day. Oh, you man, that was really fun, too. Do you, John, we have about two minutes left, but can we keep going? Do you have time or are you, are you? I can, I can go for another like half an hour. Okay, per perfect. Yeah, I just, I'm like, just totally into like hearing you talk about the recordings and I hate yeah. to cut you off because you have so many stories and so much to say and like so many things to, to tell us. We could go on for months, literally, and we could sit here and listen to all these recordings after and af after that. That's so crazy. So you were playing that Bruckner Five with um, Mr. Ashahina in, uh, was it in Orchestra Hall? That was on the German clarinet. German clarinet. No kidding. And did you learn anything from that uh, experience on the German clarinet? Yes, because certain repertoire really suits that instrument. Huh. And I and I said, oh, you know, that I might be able to play Brahms on the German clarinet. So when when uh, I think first came in and did a whole Brahms program, I said, you know what, I think I can do it. So we did Brahms second, and I pulled out my German clarinet and played played Brahms second. And then we did some Schumann symphonies and they were great in Schumann symphonies. Wow. You know, I wouldn't want to play them in Daphnis and Chloe or, you know, yeah. Kostakovich, um, you know, symphonies or some, it's just like, it's a different aesthetic. It's a different yes. sleeping aesthetic. It's a different sound. It's much more, you know, like um, sustained and, and uh, you know, 
yeah, I would say just a different different kind of phrasing and a different sound because it's a different um, equipment, you know, different wow. kind of. Different Isn't that cool though? You have different options with different equipment. I mean, it's like you just had all of these, ex you know, ideas and possibilities kind of come to light. Yeah. Um, shall we uh, continue? And I'll see you in a second. And someone asks, what are the differences between Muti and Abato? So we'll talk about that. <clears throat> hey, we're back and we are going live with John Broussier. And we're talking about his favorite recordings. And we are also getting to know uh, the history of the Chicago Symphony through the recording stories. So John has a lot of stories for us and he's been really um, generous and it's just so nice to spend a Saturday morning together with uh, John. And I'm just really happy to talk to him. Hey, welcome back, John. Thanks. I was just, you know, just saying how much I really enjoy your time with us and your stories and your generosity. It's just, I, these stories are fantastic. I mean, it's, it brings the orchestra to life. Yeah, well, you know, um, both you and I got the request from our, um, our fine archivist, Frank Villella, to choose our five favorite CSO recordings. And this, this um, request came a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, and I still, it's like, it's a monumental task to choose just five out of the thousands of recordings that the CSO has done. And so I'm just like um, filtering through the ones that I remember and as being uh, amazing. And I'm finding some incredible um, surprises too. Like, uh, like what, what were some of the surprises? And before you say that, we have to say hi to Karen Bazarak. She's watching. Hey, Karen. I love Karen. Karen you know, Karen uh, is the only cellist I've ever played for as like a horn lesson. I remember I like went to Karen and I said, Karen, I know you're from Chicago. You got to teach me that Chicago style. And she, all she could say is like, man, your rhythm needs, you need to work on your rhythm. And I remember like, you know, I was like, all right, I guess that's, you know, the Chicago style is just playing with good rhythm. You know, but it was like, it was like so enlightening for me to play for someone that wasn't a horn player and she's got such great ears and it's so nice that we were both in Fort Worth together and we're now both in Chicago and we're actually neighbors. Nice. That's yeah. right. Hey, Karen. Hey. Well, um, so th some of these surprises are sort of off the beaten track recordings that you wouldn't necessarily identify. And one of them, um, a, a, a few of them have been... Um, Let's see. This was one of them, the Elgar Violin Concerto with Gil Shaham, and it's on his own uh, record label. And it's no like, kidding. Yeah, and it's like it's released commercially, but um, I I put it on, and I couldn't take it off. I couldn't stop listening because it was so beautifully, you know, wo interwoven and beautifully, and the and the sound was captured well. Who is conducting? In orchestra hall. This is David Zinman conducting. Wow. This is, um, I think, Zinman's only recording with the Chicago Symphony. Huh. And we took it on tour. We took, we took this, um, this piece on tour um, to Florida. And in... See John, this? is that you in the, in the picture? Yeah, that's me. That's you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. There's Dave. There's Dave. Uh, Dave Griffin. Yeah. No kidding. And yeah, and Bill Buckman. Yeah. And then Eugene Isatoff. Yep. Oh man, look at that! Fantastic. So this was this was this picture was taken in the um, concert hall in Miami. It was the first concert um, that was done in that hall, or one of the first concerts done done in the um, hall in Miami where we just played in January. Wow! Is it which is the Arsht Center, correct? Arsht Center. That's yeah. right. I don't know mm -hmm. if it was named that. I think it, yeah. So that was a surprise to to pull out, and then. Um, Another recording, I mean, the, the Rite of Spring with Barenboim. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the, the CSOs recorded the Rite of Spring several times, you know, with um, Ozawa and with Schulte. Um, and Bam I have to say, those album covers are, like, from that era, are just spectacular. There's, like, yeah. another one, I think, of uh, the Chicago River. Right. From right. that same kind of uh, vintage. And those, those, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just have to say those are like some of my favorite album covers. Right. The album covers are, are, are great. Bring back memories too. But you said Write a Spring with Barenboim? Write a Spring with Barenboim, which we did in also on a video in Cologne. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, he did a lot of things really well. And, you know, I, I, 
immediately pops into mind Wagner and Mo and Mozart. He did Wagner and Mozart so so great. Wow. Uh, but but this this Stravinsky is totally amazing. And, no, his Mozart piano recordings. I mean, the piano concertos are yeah. some of my favorite recordings. Did you uh, get to play any of those with um, Maestro Bernborn? Oh yeah, and Beethoven. We did the Beethoven piano concertos. In fact, I remember doing um, the Emperor Concerto on uh, the day that Mathieu Dufour auditioned for the CSO. And Berenboim was playing solo and conducting. And that night, he invited Mathieu to sit in on, on the, so this was part of his audition. It was like, Mathieu, he's won the audition, but let's have him play in the orchestra. So, so I had to lend Mathieu my extra um, uh, coat. <laughs> And and um, and then he sat there and we played the Emperor Concerto without a conductor except for Berenboim conducting at the piano. That's something that I'll never forget. And I bet I mean Mathieu is just one of the special musicians I've gotten a chance to work with. He's a, a, a good friend of mine. So this this is not an off the beaten track recording, but Otello is one of the high points of Chicago symphony history. We did this in 2012 at Orchestra Hall three times, and then we took it to Carnegie Hall in New York. Wow. And it, it was, um, it wasn't Maestro uh, Muti's first recording with us, because his first recording with, with us was the Verdi Requiem. It wasn't uh, the Prokofiev Romeo and Juliet? Well, that, that's, a, that's another one of my favorites, you know, that, that, my that, that's, that's a great one too. I mean, we but but these these uh, are uh, so do the Romeo and Juliet and the Requiem predate the Otello possibly or not? Well, Romeo and Juliet was done, um, I think, the the next year. Let me just see here. It says here, 2013. So that was done the year after um, Otello. The Otello was done in oh 2011. So a couple of years. And so this was this was during the period of time when I was acting principal. So it was when um, Muti first came in. I was acting principal, so I got to record a lot of these things before Steve became principal. And one of them was Romeo and Juliet, and one of them was Otello. And I remember doing Otello in um, Carnegie Hall, and that being like so much more colorful because of the acoustics. And I said, "Gosh, I wish they could have recorded." the Carnegie Hall performances of these, because they were in a, in a special way, even more um, kaleidoscopic in their drama, you know? Yeah. But this is a really, really good, um, you know, document of the way we did Otello in those days. Wow. Yeah. And I think um, everyone might know, but uh, Ricardo Muti is a scholar of Verdi. Oh, it's it's kind of like his life's mission to really do Verdi in the best possible, most elegant um, musical way. Nobody does Verdi better than than Muti. He's the um, Verdi uh, uh, proponent. And you know, you you and I, we um, did you play um, Aida? Yes, I did. Absolutely, it was. They recorded that. That was one of the great, amazing uh, opportunities. That was really unbelievable. I mean, it was so much fun. And, you know, I'll never forget that um, that story he told about the tenor. Do you remember? I forget. Was it Rene? I forget which, sing which singer it was, but it was a, a famous singer from the day. Yeah. And he was saying that Verity wrote this um, this high note in the first act. And it, Verity writes it with a decrescendo going up to the high note. And so the singer studied and he really worked on like going up to this high note and like, you know, doing a day crescendo, which is really hard. You need like that kind of momentum to go up to the high note. And then he finally gets it after months of study and he does it in concert and he got booed, right? Like the audience, the gallery <laughs> booed him. And then, and so he goes out at like the, you know, intermission or maybe after the concert, he's got his score. He's like, look, look here, Mr. Verdi, you know, he wrote a day crescendo up to that high note. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, like the audience, like, you know, they, they pull their glasses down, they pretend to look at the score, and then they go, well, Verdi was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this has been La Scala, where they're, they're, they're brutally honest there. I know, but just like the fact that, like, they boo, the singer would go out and argue with the people who booed them, <laughs> and then the fact that the singer would be like, no, the composer was wrong. Huh? It's like, just like, <laughs> 
So, so the other, um, the other recording that I really loved that that was kind of a surprise to me was the Firebird yeah. that we did with Boulez. And I remember that being fun to do. I remember that being being great when we were doing it. But then to listen to it, it's like, gosh, you know, um, I wonder if I could play that way now. You know, it was like, it was so like, gosh, you know, I, that's the way I really want to sound. Because I was on D clarinet. You know, I was on the piccolo clarinet in this, yeah. this recording. And it was like, Boulez really brought something special out of the orchestra. We made a lot of recordings with Boulez. Wow. Wow. I mean, so what do you think he was able to capture in that recording? And what about the playing? I mean, so we have to know that Stravinsky was a Russian composer and that he studied in France and he wrote this music while he was in France for the Ballet Russe. So having a French conductor, especially someone who's like a composer, really fits that piece. I mean, it's like that's the, the right person to conduct. But how did how was he able to get a special sound from the orchestra and how was he able to get a special sound from the texture of this Stravinsky piece? Clarity, you know, he always, not only his um, requests to the orchestra, but just his motions brought out clarity in the orchestra. And then he would take the most complex piece. I remember recording um, uh, Pelis and Melisande of Schoenberg with him. Um, and that's a very, very thick piece. It's, a, it's an early Schoenberg work. And him taking apart different, very, very thick uh, parts and bringing out the important parts and like cutting down the un unimportant parts. And that would immediately become like a crystalline clarity. So that was one of the Boulez's, you know, we, we recorded Mahler 9 with him. I mean, isn't that, isn't that one of the, like, the kind of hallmarks of genius, though, is where you're able to take something complicated and make it simple. That and, was... and you're able to, you know, explain what you understand to someone who might not know anything about what it is. It's just like Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, when he explains physics, it's like, oh, I don't understand physics very well at all. But when he explains it, I'm like, oh, I, this makes sense. Yep. And Boulet was able to do that so well with us and so many other groups so that's why we were so lucky to have him in the transition between Barenboim and um and Muti and we yeah. were all lucky to have uh, Bernard Heitink wow. who several amazing recordings with us too you know the one that I just pulled out today was Shostakovich 4 another very complex piece that we took on tour with yes. with Heitink and and he just you know uh, he was a master and and several Mahler symphonies Mahler one Mahler two Mahler three Mahler six all those we recorded on our own house label you know on on CSO Resound has has many treasures on it Man. and so one I, of the honestly I wish I wish that I was able to hear all those recordings that maybe aren't available anymore but I mean I just like for I'm a student of music and a student of I mean, I just feel like every time I listen to you play, every time I listen to the recordings from the, the predecessors, I learned something. And what's kind of sad for me is that like, you know, um, like there's like, there are the pieces that you can find in the, in the um, standard Chicago uh, symphony um, catalog, but then there's like ones that you're just like, man, I wish I could hear them play this, or man, I wish I would have gotten to hear, you know, them do that. You yeah, know, that's, that's as a student of music, I really feel like sad that I can't hear some of those. I, you know, I learn every day from hearing, um, you know, now I've been listening to these recordings and I'm, I'm learning by just listening to what my colleagues did, you know, 40 and 50 years ago. Yes. And I'm thinking, gosh, you know, this is the way it's done, you know? And one of the, one of the recordings that, that I pulled out that's kind of a sleeper is this. What is that? It's um, Elliot Carter. Carter's Partita, and it's um, uh, Luciano Berrio, and it is uh, Toru Takamitsu. And these three composers wrote music for the um, centenary of the Chicago Symphony. They were, they were all commissioned to write uh, pieces for the centenary of the Chicago Symphony. And these three of these pieces are, um, are represented on this album. And it's, it's like, you know, it, it would go by if, if you didn't really look for it, you know? It's, wow. It was on Teldeck, and, and I happened to pull it out from 
you know, a stack that I had and I'm listening to it and I'm saying, gosh, you know, there were some amazing sounds there that I... Um, and Elliot Carter's not easy. It's really modern. It's really, it's kind of atonal. Um, not really, but I mean, it's like, it can't oh, be. No, it's more. really, totally is atonal. And he, he was, uh, you know, luckily, Barenboim was a big Carter, um, you know, proponent. He, he, um, and, and I got to know Carter really well. And we did, um, Boulez and, and I and, uh, did, and the CSO did the American premiere of Carter's clarinet concerto in 1998. And that's, it's got to remain one of the highlights of my career. Oh man, that's so cool. So is it is is it time to wrap up, John? Yeah, I'm I'm looking yeah, my my family is <laughs> Hey, I we really appreciate spending time with you this morning. I mean, it's just it's always fun hearing you talk about music. You're so passionate and it's just like your memory is just crystal clear from those those re recording sessions. Just to tell and, you um you know, one other one other story of um Oh, I don't know if Jay's listening, but uh, when we were recording Mahler 2, um, uh, sometimes we finish recording a movement and then the engineer or the producer comes out and says, we need to do this one spot again. And sometimes people have gone home and it's like, Schulte uh, says, okay, we're going to do back this one place again. And then everybody's sitting there, but Jay Friedman is not there. And I just... No. He's saying, there the hell is Mr. Friedman. Smaller <laughs> <laughs> too. And everybody's like, oh gosh, you know, I think Jay went home. And then another recording, another Barenboim recording. Well, that, wait, 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 wait. Go back. No. Did they, did they, were they able to like get Mr. Friedman back or were they like, uh, I, did, did he drive no. back or did they get another trombonist? Like what happened? They had, they had to get him back. They had to, they had to just like, I, he might have been in the, you know, down the down the street at the coffee shop. I I don't know, but he he eventually came back, and we did that we did that patch. Okay, yeah, because I I wouldn't, you know, I, Schulte's one person I wouldn't want to make angry, you know, and that those <laughs> eyes and that you know that head screaming <laughs> skull. Yeah, exactly. Smiled sometimes. Yeah. Oh yeah, I wouldn't want to make him angry. <laughs> I noticed somebody asked, what's, what's the difference between Abado and Muti? Yes. Well, um, probably the only similarity between them is that they're Italian. <laughs> right? And they're opera. They're very lyrical conductors. They're very, like, operatic when they conduct. Right. Uh, Abado, at the time when he was conducting us, was very soft-spoken. You know, it was like he, he was... Um, like almost mumbling when he he'd be in rehearsals and and he'd uh, if something wasn't together he'd kind of look at his score and he'd go not together and then we'd do it again and then and then he'd stop and work on little things like that and then in the concert he everything would just come alive it would be like <laughs> and would happen in the concert because all he had to do was like like show certain things and he was very demonstrative he usually had a, a pretty long baton and very clear you know and so it was um was interesting because because Otto um was so um meticulous in rehearsals but so you know you had to really really listen listen hard and Muti you know I think Muti is more wears his heart on his sleeve a little bit more yeah and and you know he he brings great moments of of energy and joy and fire you know and in a way he he reminds me of Schulte more than than Abado he because because Schulte would have this incredible fire and incredible energy that would come out you know even in uh, rehearsals or, or recordings. Wow, yeah, and he's, he's just so intense too, right? Muti has that intensity. Intensity, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. It's, such a gift to be able to listen to all these recordings again. And oh, I forgot to mention Giulini. My my own my only recording with Giulini was done in my first year of the orchestra, which was his last year as a guest conductor of our orchestra. We did the Schubert uh, Fourth Symphony with Giulini, and I, I remember I was playing second clarinet. Clark Brody. This was his last. You're in the orchestra, my first year in the orchestra. 
this this fourth symphony of um, uh, Schubert, it's paired with the uh, unfinished symphony. And in, in those days, we used to have double woodwinds and everything. You know, we used to have if, even if there were only two clarinet parts, we'd have four clarinets sitting there for Schubert symphonies, Beethoven symphonies, Brahms symphonies, Bruckner symphonies. Everything we double woodwinds. No kidding. But I got to sit in on a lot of recordings that I wasn't necessarily playing solos on. So, but this fourth symphony was the only recording I ever did with Giulini. And, um, you know, everybody just loved Giulini because you, just he was such a lovable guy, you know, and, and he was so soft-spoken and almost self-deprecating at, at times. You really wanted to do it because you loved him and you, you wanted to bring it out the best way for, for him. So I, it's like I've had so many amazing opportunities and you're giving me an opportunity to revisit all of these oh man john thank you so much for your experience you're just um so generous with your time and your knowledge and your stories Let's uh, i don't know if people realize how rare it is to have someone at your level sit down for an hour and a half and just talk about their favorite recordings it's like you're you're like a superstar of the clarinet world and you're just sitting here and you're just like you know, sharing with us these these things that really mean so much to you, and it's and and your memory is just as as I said before, is just crystal clear. It's it's so fun. You take us right there when you talk about these, and I I do feel like man, we could just go. Oh, this could be like a series. We could talk about recordings like you know once a month with you, and you'd never run out of stories. So I, I, you know, I'll look forward to it. The podcast, man. The podcast. Yeah, we're going to start it, man. Absolutely. The Fireside Chats will be moving on to podcasts. I bought all those that equipment, so I'm really looking forward to transferring this. And, man, thank you again. Uh, everyone uh, says hi and thank you. Uh, I know we have a couple thank yous up here. Uh, Dawn Guard said thank you. Four Flutes, One Eye says so inspiring and informative. Uh, Gabby Vargas gives a lot of hearts. Uh, let's see. Esteban says, Bravo, John, thanks for sharing this great information. Giovanni uh, Diaprile says, thank you. And it says, you guys are the best. And uh, and then Four Flutes, One Eye says, a great person. Thanks, John. This is so exciting, Dave. Have a great day and let's talk soon. Hey, big hugs, man. Stay Bye. safe and stay well. And we'll talk soon. All, All right. Bye-bye. Right. <laughs>